Well, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're going to worship our God. We love to call your name. It's something we cannot explain that happens when we proclaim your great name your great name we love to call your name is something we cannot explain that happens when we proclaim your great name your great name king jesus no other name king jesus none stronger we call on you it changes when we call on your name are we gonna sing that again we love to call your name it's something we cannot explain that happens when we proclaim your great name your great name king jesus no other name king jesus none stronger we call on you things changes when we call on your name king jesus king jesus no other name king jesus none stronger we call on you things changes when we call on your name there's power in the name of jesus there's power in your name there is power in the name of jesus power in your name there is power there is power in the name of so much power power in your name there is power there is power in the name of so much power power in things change when we call you things change when we call you jesus things change when we call your name things change when we call you jesus things change when we call your name i'm free i'm free when i call Like 
testimony of your salvation and your goodness, Jesus. We're just going to enter into our time of prayer, just right where you are. Just make this song your prayer that, Jesus, you are our testimony. You are the reason that we sing this morning. So I just ask that you close your eyes and bow your head and just lift your burdens and your prayers to the one who sits on the throne. God, we come before you this morning and we worship you. We thank you for everything you're doing. We thank you that you are indeed our testimony and that you are here with us. You are always with us, Lord God. And we just ask that you just give us peace for the journey and confidence in you, Lord God, that you've got this and that you are in control of all things. In the precious name of Jesus.
just continue to worship our God. Lord, we're so thankful for you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for just laying it down for us, God. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame in love you came and gave amazing grace thank you for this love Lord thank you for the nail pierced hands wash me in your
Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for. enter into this act of worship, I just am so reminded of symbols in the Bible. You know, John uses this language of a lamb, and it, and it harkens back to the Old Testament in this sacrificial system, and when, when families would bring to the temple a lamb that would stand in their place for the sins they had committed. We're reminded in communion of that very same sacrifice, that sacrifice of once and for all that Jesus made for us. We're reminded of the blood poured out and the body broken for each and every one of us. The lamb slain from the beginning of the world because God had a plan for you and I. So let's go into this time of communion remembering that great sacrifice that our Savior has given for us. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you that you stood in our place. God, each and every one of us is fully deserving of the punishment for our sin. But you love us so much. You took that punishment on yourself. God, we pray right now, we bless this, this, this juice and this bread. God, that stands for the blood that covers our sins and the, the body that was broken for the atonement of those sins and for our healing. We give you all the glory and all the praise. Let's eat together. Let's drink also. thank him. Thank him in your own words. Father God, may we never go a day without remembering your great sacrifice for us. Without remembering through the act of communion what it means for each and every one of our lives. Lord, we worship you today. 
give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor because you're the only one that deserves it. Let's go and sing that song again. so thankful we thank you for dying for us and the price that you paid God it's all because of you we thank you and we give you praise this morning in Jesus name we all say amen at this time we're going to take our tithes and offering just a reminder that there are three ways to give you can go online to our website at ctownhope.com Drop it in the mail to P.O. Box 579, Chestertown, Maryland, 21620. Or feel free to drop by at the church office Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give and to be um, your hands and your feet extended here on this earth. And we just pray that as we give, that you would just use this tithes and offerings for your glory and for the salvation of many in our community, in our area. We love you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We just want to make you aware of a few announcements coming up here at Hope Fellowship. We have our movie on the lawn coming back on Friday, October 2nd at 7 p.m. We're going to be watching The Lion King. So we invite you and your family to come on out and be a part of that socially distanced event as we spread out on the lawn and enjoy the movie together. Bring your own chairs, blankets, bring your own popcorn and drinks, and we'll have a fun evening on Friday, October 2nd at 7 p.m. The rain date for this event will be October 9th. And then we have two conferences coming up. We have a men's conference happening October 17th. Here at the church, we're going to stream virtually the conference from Pendel called Endurance. And we will be doing that from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on October 17th. So men, we invite you to come on out for that and have a great day of just learning from some great speakers. And then ladies, on Saturday, November 14th, we're going to do the same thing. 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. We're going to be watching a conference called uh, Reclaim 2020 as we just um, fellowship together and just hear from special speakers and the word. And we hope that you'll join us and you can sign up for those events and register and pay for those online at our website at ctownhope.com. And if you feel better, you can call the um, church office and register that way as well if you're not quite comfortable with dealing with online. So we hope that you will we'll see you at those events. And then we are so excited that we're finally going to be back in our church building on Sunday, October 4th. We'll be back to our three services, 8, 9, 30, and 11, by reservation. So we want to make sure that you get ready because the week before that, we're going to be making reservations to come into the building so we can make sure we keep our numbers to a safe and healthy um, capacity for you and for your family. And so we will give you further information next week about that. But mark your calendars for Sunday, October 4th. 8, 9.30, and 11, we'll be back in the building. But we're still going to be streaming live at 9.30, so we have not forgotten about you. For those who are not comfortable coming back in the building, we'll still have our 9.30 a.m. live service 
for you online through Facebook. So we hope that you'll make yourself either um, ready for church in the building or online October 4th. Let's go to the word today. Well, good morning, Hope Fellowship family. Thank you once again for being with us online. Today, we're going to finish up the life of Samson. He's the very last judge that we see in the book of Judges that God used to deliver Israel from their enemies. And he is probably one of the most frustrating characters in the entire Bible. He was a man who was given so much by God. From his birth, Samson had a very unique call upon his life. God called him and set him apart to help begin the deliverance of the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. And to aid him in accomplishing that task, God gifted him with supernatural strength. Although he had this amazing calling and this amazing supernatural strength, he, like many of us, made poor decision after poor decision. Decisions that ended up making him weak and wreaked all kind of havoc in his life. He was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. Now, we've seen Samson, as we work through his story, we've seen him continually overstep the Nazarite vows that God has established in his life to help him, to help protect him from the damaging consequences of sin. Let me go and remind you one more time what those Nazarite vows were. The vows were this, no drinking of alcohol, no touching of a dead body, and no cutting of hair. Now, I hope you've rightly understood by now that the keeping of these vows was an outward sign of what was going on in Samson's heart. There was nothing magical about not drinking alcohol or not touching a dead body in and of itself, nor was there anything special or magical in the lockets of the hair on Samson's head. These vows were established by God in his life for one reason, to help him keep his heart and his life right with God. They were a tool that God intended to help teach Samson how to walk and live in his ways wholeheartedly. And so the secret to his strength was really, it wasn't the hair, it was his relationship with God. And the breaking of those vows, what they were is they were a reflection of what was really going on in Samson's heart. It was an indicator of where his relationship with God really was. Although God had been incredibly patient with Samson, incredibly merciful and gracious, there came a day when God's patience with Samson came to an end. And what we saw is Samson compromised himself right out of his relationship with God. There came a day when he lost his incredible strength and found himself with eyes gouged out, enslaved in a prison of the Philistines. I mean, it is one of the saddest, most tragic stories that you will find in the entire Bible. Let me go ahead and remind you how it all went down as we get into our lesson this morning. Samson, if you remember, once again gives into his weakness for Philistine women. He thought he could handle sin and win. He fell in love with a woman named Delilah, who was bribed by the leaders of the Philistines to find out the secret to his incredible strength. And after she had nagged him and nagged him and nagged him, finally Samson is wore down and he gives in to Delilah. And we're told in Judges chapter 16, beginning in verse 17, so he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she went, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines Come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with silver in their hands. 
having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. As I read that, the most frightening part of this story for you and me to ponder is that Samson, he didn't even know that the Lord had left him. And I think that explains to us a a, a teaching that we find in the New Testament, something said by Jesus. If you remember, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, Jesus said himself that he would rather people be hot or cold towards him than lukewarm. And the question is, why is that? Well, if you're cold, at least you know that you need to get your life right with God. But when a person is lukewarm, what happens is they fool themselves into thinking they're right with God when they're really not. Samson is a prime example of that principle. He didn't even know it until it was too late. It's a tragic story. His story's tragic. Think about it. Missed opportunities, wasted potential. What you have right now is a story of regret, and you think of what could have been and what wasn't. I mean, his story, for the most part, up until this point, is a story of epic failure. If there was ever a guy who belonged in the hall of shame, it was Samson. But shockingly, you won't find him there. It's interesting, if you go to the New Testament book of Hebrews, you find him in what's called the hall of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 is God's hall of fame for people who lived by faith in the Old Testament. So what you have to understand, it's a real honor to have your name mentioned in there. That's where Samson's name is found. Look at it with me. After 31 verses full of Old Testament people like Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It says down in verse 32, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to talk about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword whose weaknesses was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Listed among the other heroes of the faith is Samson. And what a wonderfully encouraging phrase that we see attached to him. Look at it. Whose weaknesses was turned to strength. In Samson's case, whose weaknesses, mistakes, failures, shortcomings were turned to strength. Here's what we're going to learn today as we finish the life of Samson, and I have it in your notes. Samson teaches us, with God, failure is never final. If you will turn to God wholeheartedly and surrender fully to Him, He can take your greatest failures, your greatest mistakes, and turn them into a strength that he uses for his purposes and his glories. Judges chapter 16, verse 21 through 31, is the story of how God did that in Samson's life. How God took him from being a zero in his faith to a hero of the faith. Now, as we study it, as we work through the story, I want you to see four things. Number one, I want you to see the result of Samson's sin. Number one, the result of Samson's sin. Now, before we can talk about his restoration, we must first talk about the consequences of his sin. Judges chapter 16, verse 21, it says, then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they sent him to grinding in the prison. Now, I want you to notice that the price of sin is always blinding, binding, and grinding. 
Samson's fate teaches us that. Do you see how his sin throughout his life literally turned back on him? I mean, you could think of it this way. It was like a boomerang that came back to strike him. Think about his life for a moment. Samson had done what was right in his own eyes. He followed the lust of his eyes. And now the Philistines have gouged his eyes out. Historians tell us that most likely his eyes were burned out with fire. And so he burned with lust, and he got burned himself. Samson refused to live within the boundaries of the Nazarite vow that God established to protect his freedom. And now the Philistines had literally taken away all his freedoms. He had visited a prostitute in the Philistine city of Gaza. Now he's a prisoner in the Philistine city of Gaza. Samson continually chased after Philistine women, and now he found himself in a Philistine prison doing the work of a Philistine woman. That's what's meant by he was grinding in the prison. That was a, he was going around and around a millstone growing, grinding flour. That was a job often left to the women of the day. What I want you to understand is like a boomerang, Samson's sin came back to strike him with eerie similar, similarities to his mistakes. But that really shouldn't come to a surprise to any of us. Let me tell you what it, what it really is. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. The Apostle Paul talked about this in Galatians chapter 6. Look at it with me. Paul says, do not be deceived. Okay, otherwise do not believe something different. This is what you need to know. God cannot be mocked. Now watch this. Here's the law. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. What kind of harvest you have in your life is most often determined by what kind of seeds that you plant. Every decision that you make is a seed that will eventually bear good fruit or bad fruit. And that fruit will be proportional to the type of seed that you plant. That explains why Samson's sin led to the bind, blinding and the grinding in, 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 in the blinding here in the prison. I mean, think about it. Just like in the agricultural world, there's a period of time between when you, when you sow that seed for the plant and then the reaping of the harvest. When you plant a seed, the fruit doesn't show up until down the road, until harvest time. It's the same with sin. This is why we often sin and think we're in control and we've got it and it's no big deal because we forget that there, there is always a time when the harvest of the decision that you made is gonna come. The, desin, the sinful decisions we make today often don't bear fruit immediately, but eventually they will bear fruit. That was certainly true of Samson for 20 years years he continually gave into the immediate gratification of his fleshly desires and you know what he thought no big deal i got this but there came a harvest eventually it eventually all caught up with him while there may be a long period of time between the sowing and reaping there's always a reaping sometimes the painful the pain of sinful decisions is not felt until years down the road. Now that's, let's go and read further what Paul says because he flips this around and he says, let us not become weary in doing good. Now why do we become weary in doing good? Why do we become weary in following God's ways? Because we don't often see the results that we want right away. We don't often get immediate fruit. But Paul says, let us not become weary in doing good, living by God's ways, walking in righteousness. Why? For at the proper time, otherwise down the road, in your future, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. You know what the idea here is? It's going to be hard sometimes to walk in God's ways in this life. You may even have to suffer to do it. And you may have been walking in God's ways and it doesn't seem to be paying off and you're watching other people in your life and like, well, they're doing it the world's way and they're having fun and the things seem to be going well with them. Listen, there is always fruit that comes in the long run. 
As Paul says, don't give up even when you don't see the fruit right away. Because when you walk by God's ways, you are literally carving out a future that will bear good fruit. There may not always be an immediate payoff for making godly decisions now, but don't forget if there's a sowing, there is always a reaping. There is always a payoff in your future. Sowing always leads to reaping. So think about it. If you sow to please the Spirit, it leads to life is what Paul says. But if you sow to please the flesh, it leads to destruction. The result of Samson's sin was in direct proportion to what he sowed, like a boomerang, because what you sow, you reap. That leads me to the second thing I want you to see. Let's call this the restoration of Samson's heart. You know, if you just read verse 21 about the consequences of Samson's sin, and don't read verse 22, you would think that God had given up on Samson for good. But that's not the case. It's really never the case with God. While God may hand us over to our sin, either to discipline us or to bring about an environment that brings us back to him, his love for us always continues. Notice the first words of verse 22. It says, but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now, this is one small verse, but it's probably the most important verse in the entire story of Samson's life. Because what it tells us is no matter how far he fell away from his walk with God, he did not fall beyond the possibility of God's forgiveness. In his absolute weaknesses, Samson here begins to reach out to God and God heard him. The outward sign of Samson's hair, really, it's it's a wonderful picture of the process that was taking place in his heart. Slowly, his hair began to grow back. Slowly, his heart returned to his fellowship with God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 tells us this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It's a wonderful verse. You know, there are, really, there are generally two responses to our failure that, that in our life. And the natural response, number one, is remorse. And this is where most people stop, and this is where most people get stuck when it comes to their failures. I feel bad about what I did. I shouldn't have done it. I'm a terrible person. And depending on the amount of pain associated with your failure, if you only have remorse about your sin inevitably one of a couple things will happen. Sometimes remorse will turn inward and what we end up doing is we end up taking it out on ourselves. I'm horrible. I'm no good. I'm the worst person that ever lived. I have no future. I I hate myself. I hate my life. So sometimes our remorse turns inward and that's where we're stuck. Sometimes remorse will turn outward and we end up taking it out on others. And so this is where the victim mentality comes in. Well, listen, if they didn't do what they did, then I would have never done what I did. I mean, that stupid Delilah, it's all her fault. There are a lot of people walking around stuck in remorse in their life and the way they're handling it is they're blaming everybody else for the decisions that they sowed. Then sometimes remorse will turn upward. Sometimes we take it out on God. We look at our failures and the fruit that's come from it, and we say, God, this is all your fault. Why would you allow this to happen? And we, we end up bitter with God. Listen, if all you ever have when you fail is remorse, you will end up a very bitter person, mad at yourself, mad at the world, and mad at God. There are a lot of people walking around, and they are stuck in their remorse. If I'd be honest with you, remorse... It's the natural response to failure, but it's not the best response. The better response, number two, is repentance. Here's what happens. Here's what repentance sounds like. God, I own this. My fault. I blew it. I'm going to take responsibility. doesn't matter how I got here, but I'm going to take responsibility for where I am. 
And so, God, I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Please forgive me. I'm turning away from that which is sinful and turning to that which is right. Listen, the word repentance, and you've heard me say this over and over, literally means to turn from your lower ways to God's higher ways. It's literally to make a 180, to do a U-turn. It's God, I'm humbling myself before you. I repent, please forgive me. I now place my failure in your hands to be redeemed, and Lord, use it for your divine purposes. See, here's the deal. Remorse is looking backward. And when you're looking backward, you're always stuck in your past. You're bound in your past. But repentance, what happens is it frees you up to begin walking forward. Let me help you understand why repentance, why placing your failure in God's hand is so very important. Although God forgave Samson, he didn't restore Samson's eyesight. God does not make done things undone. He does forgive us our sins and restores our relationship with him, but more often than not, we still bear the scars of sin. So think about it this way. If we commit adultery and a child comes from that adulterous relationship, absolutely we're forgiven the moment we repent but the birth of that child is not erased. If we commit murder, we're forgiven when we repent, but you can't go back and unmurder that person. If we, if we drive drunk and maybe we kill another person, we can be forgiven, absolutely, but you can't go back and undo what's been done. God forgives us of our sins, but most often the consequences still remain. And I'm sure that there are many that could confess, yes, God has forgiven me, but I've had to bear the consequences. And while we always want to uphold the teaching that God's grace can forgive everyone, we don't ever want to teach to the point that we we tell that, well, you can just do anything you want and God will just make it all better and, and, and he'll erase any kind of consequences. Nope, God cannot be mocked, Paul says, because it's the spiritual law of sowing and reaping. This is the way it works. We must always remember that God will forgive, but there are consequences that he will not undo. Samson is a perfect illustration of that. Now, because God will not always undo all the consequences, you will do one of two things with the scars that are left by sin. You will either look at those scars and allow them to keep you stuck and bound to your past, or you will look at those scars as a weakness that when put in the hands of God can turn into a strength. Yes, you heard me right. The failures, the mistakes, the things you wish you could go back but can't change, can't undo, God will turn into a strength in your life to accomplish his purposes if you will fully put them in his hands. Because with God, failure is never final. He can work all things for good for those who love him and fully surrender their lives to him. But rest assured, you will have a fight on your hands to see your scars as something God can turn into a strength. Let me tell you why that is. And that brings us to the third thing I want you to see. I want you to see the ridicule of Samson's enemies. You know, there will always be those who want to remind you of your failures. Who will want to throw your failures back in your face and keep you defined by your past? That was certainly true of Samson's enemies. I want you to remember, Samson has already been forgiven. His hair had already begun to grow back. He's back in fellowship with God. And look what it says in verse 23. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Now let me stop for a minute and set the scene for you. The Philistines assembled in their temple that was much like a coliseum. I mean, think of it as a stadium full of people. And as we're going to see, there were at least 5,000 Philistines present. And they've gathered to worship their false god, Dagon, for the capture of Samson. 
What they fail to realize is it was really God who allowed Samson to be captured. But here they are trying, worshiping this false god. He was the god of harvest, and he was portrayed as having a man's head and a fish's body, is what we learn from history. I mean, it's weird, right? But this is who they're worshiping. This is the god that they're serving. Now, it says in verse 24, when the people saw him, they praised their god, saying, our god has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land. Now, what are they talking about there? Do you remember when Samson caught the foxes and tied torches to their tails and burned all the Philistine crops? They're saying, this is him. This is the guy. And it says, the one who laid waste to our land and multiplied our slain. So do you remember the jawbone incident where he took the jawbone of a donkey and he killed a thousand of them? They're saying, this is the guy. This is the guy who has been our enemy for so many years. Now look at verse 25. It says, while they were in high spirits, they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for them. I want you to think what an awful experience to have to endure for Samson. Think about the shame, the mockery, the condemnation. I mean, he is standing in a stadium full of people and they are heaping insult after insult on him. They're reminding him of what he used to be, and they're saying, look at what you are now. I mean, the, the enemy is literally rubbing his failure in his face. They're attempting to define his entire life as a failure. And don't you think for one minute that Samson didn't feel the full weight of his mistakes, the condemnation, the regret, the remorse, the remorse he must have felt right now in this moment. And, and remember, listen, he's been forgiven, but he can't go back and undo what has already been done. He is where he is because of the choices that he's made. I mean, this scene could have defined the rest of Samson's life. He could have been stuck in this scene forever forever cowering in front of his enemies, forever being defined by his failures, forever being bound by his past. And that is exactly what the enemy wanted. Can I say that's what the devil wants to do with my failure and your failures as well? He wants the story of your life to be defined by your failures. He wants you to be stuck in your past. He wants you to feel the shame always. He wants you to continue in the condemnation. He wants to keep you bound to what happened in your past. But I'm here to tell you that it doesn't have to be that way because with God, failure is never final. That leads me to the last thing I want you to see, the return of Samson's strength. Judges chapter 16, verse 25, it says, When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servants who had held, the servant who had held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women, all the rulers of the Philistines were there. So all the leaders of the Philistines. I mean, this is like the, this is like the Senate and the, and the House and the President and the judges. They're all there. And it says, and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me. O God, please strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his hand, his hand on one, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. Did you notice that last phrase? It's interesting. God used Samson in far greater ways after his failure than he did before his failure. Let me tell you why that is. I mean, first of all, why that is is because God failure is not final with God. 
God can take things in your life and turn them around and use you. You, you. God still wants to use you. But let me tell you why he killed more people in his death than he did in his entire life when it came to the Philistines. Because the level of your strength is proportional to the level of your surrender. When you surrender your entire life to God, when you lay it all down, you become the most usable to God. You become someone God's power can work through in powerful ways. I mean, isn't that what happened to Samson here? I mean, he says, God, I'm giving you everything to accomplish. If I have to die my very life to accomplish what you've called me to accomplish, then I'm willing to do that. Samson finally fully surrenders his entire life to God. And this is where he becomes most usable to God. Do you know where else he became, what else he became? Here's the cool thing. He became like Jesus in this moment. I want you to think about it. Jesus was willing to lay down his very life in complete surrender to the will of God in order to redeem us from our sin. Think about Jesus. All alone, stretched out and hanging on a wooden cross, he surrendered his life to accomplish God's plan and purpose for his life so that we could be redeemed. And by doing so, what did Jesus do? He defeated death, hell, and the grave for us. He defeated the devil for us so that we could be set free. Think about Samson now. Yes, Samson was a mess most of his life. Yes, most of his life didn't look very much like Jesus. But when his story was all said and done, Jesus is what you see in his life. Think about it. He finally fully surrendered to God's plan for his life. If I have to lay my entire life down, I'm willing to do that. And here is Samson, all alone, empowered by God, stretched out between two pillars while being abused and mocked by the enemy. Samson won the day and helped begin the redemption of the Israelites from the Philistines. What you see is a picture of Jesus in Samson's life. So when it's all said and done, this messed up man who could never seem to get it right finally gets it right. And what you see is a reflection of Jesus in his life. Can I just say that's what happens when we fully surrender our lives to God. Our lives one way or another, when we fully surrender them, surrender them to him, end up glorifying God and somehow, some way, furthering God's mission to save people from their sins. When they fully surrender, those two things happen. We end up reflecting Jesus in our life, and God somehow, some way, uses us for his mission to bring more people into the kingdom of God. Now you know why Samson ended up in Hebrews chapter 11, that hall of faith chapter in the New Testament. It's not because Samson was good. It's because God is good. It is not because Samson is some big hero. No, God is really the hero in the story. Samson just surrendered to him. And that was true of everybody else in Hebrews chapter 11. Listen, it wasn't because Samson could save himself that he's in Hebrews chapter 11. It's because of the grace and the forgiveness of God. It wasn't by his own strength that he defeated the enemy in his life. It was through God's grace and God's forgiveness and God's strength that defeated the enemy. All he had to do was fully surrender. Do you know what you call that? It's called faith. That's what real, authentic faith really looks like. And so now you know why the testimony of Samson in Hebrews chapter 11. Look at it one more time with me. And what more shall we say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, and there it is, Samson, and what's his, what's his name attached to? Whose weaknesses was turned to strength. Oh, don't you just love that? I'm here to declare to you this morning that no matter what's happened in your life, that could be your story as well. Because with God, failure is never 
ever final. Let's go back to Judges chapter 16, verse 31, Samson's story. The book of Judges comes to a close this way. Then his brothers and his father, father's whole family, went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Estol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel 20 years. With that, this strong man's life comes to a close. And as we close this morning, I want to ask you this question. What pillars do you need to push down in your life? I would imagine there's some very big pillars that the enemy has you chained to that have your mistakes written all over them. And the enemy would like to keep you bound in those mistakes. He would like to keep you stretched between everything that you've done, ridiculing you, keeping you stuck in your past, but that's not what God wants in your life. God says, if you will surrender everything to me, even those mistakes, even those failures, I'll turn them around as a testimony in your life. Because this is what God does. This is what God's intention is. He, if he can do it for Sam, Samson, he can do it for you. So would you bow your heads with me as we close this morning? Listen, if you're out there this morning and you have never put your faith in Jesus, it's the only way you can get right with a holy God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the whole reason why God sent his one and only son to the cross to die for you and me was to pay the price for our sin so that we could be forgiven and experience the grace of God in our life. God wants to have a relationship with you. And so if you're out there this morning and you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, it's the only way to have a relationship with God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can't earn your right standing with God. Your sin's too expensive. And God knew that, and so he sent his one and only son that whoever believeth in him should have eternal life and not perish. So your salvation, your right relationship with God comes by faith. It doesn't come by with remorse and I'll try harder. It comes through repentance. Thank you, God. Forgive me, God. And that's how God's grace comes into our life. So if you never put your faith in Jesus, would you just pray this prayer with me? Dear God, I come to you today and I confess that I'm a sinner. I bring all my mistakes to you. I bring my entire life to you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, and I ask you to be the Lord of my life from this day forward. I put my entire life in your hands. Help me to serve you with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, and with all my strength. Thank you for saving me. In the name of Jesus, amen. I want to do one more thing before we close. Christians, some of you, the enemy is having a field day with you. He's still trying to hold you in your regrets and in the shame of your past. Listen, you need to rest in the grace of God. You need to get unstuck and stop allowing the enemy. And the only way to do that is to get your eyes on Jesus and say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've done. I'm a child of God. I'm forgiven. The Bible says God works all things for good for those that belong to Jesus. So rejoice in that. Look forward. Yes, there are some things that can't be undone, but God's got plans to turn your mistakes into testimonies. If you'll just fully surrender everything in your life, your entire life, what will happen is you will reflect Jesus and God will end up using you somehow, some way for his mission to reach more people for the kingdom of God. Father, we just thank you for the life of Samson that we can learn. And we're so thankful that failure is never final. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love for us. In the name of Jesus, we all said together, amen.
Well, listen, God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us. I want to remind you that at the beginning of October, we will be back inside the building. We'll give you more information in the next couple of weeks on how that's all going to happen. But we also want to let you know that, I, that if you're not comfortable with coming in the building, that is perfectly okay. We will continue to have our service broadcast at 930. And so you'll always be able to tune in. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.